mentor or your copy chief or whoever's reviewing your package. And then step two is when you get those pieces of feedback, work really fast to get them done. It's even easier once you've gotten the feedback, right? That they've told you what to do. Like so, it's just a matter of doing. So people have a fear of sharing stuff and they have a fear of doing stuff, especially stuff that's unknown. So if you're gonna write your first package, right? You're gonna be fearful about writing it. So uh, those are my three things. Um, overcome your fear by working fast and, and shitterating, giving your, giving your stuff to your copy chief or mentor really, really quick. So let's recap really quick. Step one was, or, or point number one was, uh, appreciate the opportunity you've got. This is literally a chance to live an awesome, awesome, awesome life. When I got out of college, I started out really, really low in the business on the editorial side. I wasn't making very much money at all. Um, my parents had no clue what I did. I had no clue what I did. Um, and, uh, and luckily, I found copy. And I, I happen to love copy, so it's also awesome because I enjoy what I'm doing. But um, I, I'm able to make really great money today. I'm able to come into the, uh, into the office every day and be happy to be there. Uh, besides when I'm sitting on 83 in traffic. Uh, I'm happy to come in. I don't leave at 5. I usually leave really late. I really love what I do. Um, and I don't know what I would do if I wasn't working here. Like I, I hope to be working here my entire life. And so if that sounds appealing to you, don't take for granted. If that like satisfaction with your work sounds appealing to you, don't take this opportunity for granted. That's point number one. Point number two is pick the right projects and the right mentors. And point number three is work really, really, really fast. Not too, too fast, but really fast. Cool? Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Questions? Comments? Complaints? How do you get the right manner? How do you recruit one? Uh, you just keep your eyes and ears open. You know, if I had to add a point four, that would be the other thing. If you guys are in the basement, this kind of sucks, right? Because what are you going to listen to? Someone flushing the toilet next to you, unfortunately. Right? <laughs> um, uh, but I was also, this again, this is just luck. Um, you can't plan this stuff, but to the extent you are around people, keep your eyes and ears open. I was really lucky when I started here because I was on the second, well, first off, we all were not crammed into the building. Well, we're not crammed in anymore, I guess. Up until like three weeks ago, we were all crammed into the building. And uh, when I started though, we were kind of like we are right now. Things were a lot more spread out. And I was on the second floor where basically all the action was happening. So I could see all the foot traffic between Joe's office and the other floors. I could hear everything that was going on. There was a water cooler there, so people would like, talk around the water cooler. Um, and there were things that weren't even related to my job that I could just hear. Um, so if you don't know the mentors, just keep your eyes and ears open. But I can tell you right off the bat, Joe and Ryan are definitely mentors. Avaldo is definitely a mentor. Scott Bardelli is definitely a mentor. I'm not really on their level in terms of copy cheating, but I can definitely give you guys comments on whether you're on the right track with an idea or not. I can definitely critique your copy or give you feedback. I can do copy reads with you guys. I say any of the publishers actually can do that. And if you don't know the publishers, I'm one of them. Uh, Aaron Gensler is another. Um, dude with like slick back hair, really serious looking. Inslee, who you might know, like spiky hair. Paul Amos, who maybe you guys don't know. I don't know if you guys have spent any time over in the health building. Mm -hmm. um, and then Doug Hill, who's like the, the taller, older guy amongst us. So um, they can all critique copy. Uh, trying to think of who else. No, there, there are a bunch of others. Um, so just keep your eyes and ears open, though. That will change, too. You know, Those people have grown, people have left, people have come. So just always keep your eyes and ears open and make connections outside of copywriting, outside of your job. Wondering what people do, how the business works. Thank you. Any other questions? How did you grow from a copywriter to a publisher? How did um, that happen? Uh, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I guess I, I do know, actually. It actually probably was the other way around. Um, we don't really do titles in this place, so it's kind of weird, the new setup. Um, so we call ourselves publishers. But really, I'm not doing, since I've gotten that title, I'm not really doing anything different than I've ever done here. Um, but how it started was, I, uh, it's a long, long, long story, but I was working on editorial. I went to Australia on a, on a conference. Um, so that's the other thing, too. Like, uh, it's within reason, right? But the cool thing about copywriting, you get to travel places if you want to like learn about stuff at a conference, or you've got a company you're going to research, and you've got an editor and a publisher who okay you going. Like you can go travel places. So I, I got to travel to Australia. We have a business in Australia called Port Phillip Publishing, not us, but bigger of Agora, and uh, and they were putting on a conference, and Rickards was speaking there. So that's actually how we got Rickards to come on board. And it was at that point when I had talked with Jim, and we had brought him back in, and started forming that newsletter deal. 
it was around that time when I just started working on the product level a lot more. And so I got to work on a couple different things there, and then subsequently a couple more times with different editors. I got to work on uh, deal formation with the editor, so how a contract looks, how to actually negotiate their deal terms. Um, you got like kind of like the white glove like practice where you're like schmoozing with the editor, having emails back and forth, making them comfortable with us and what we do. Uh, launching the product, getting all the pub setup stuff internally. So there's a whole bunch of stuff like that basically that I got to work through coincidentally because we bought them the Rickards and then brought in a whole other bunch of editors afterwards. And then I liked it. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, if you can get involved in the business, usually copywriters are off to the side and there are copywriters that like that and there are copywriters that don't know any better and um, there are copywriters that just shouldn't probably be publishers. Um, but I have always thought it was an unfair, I have had an unfair advantage um, like working closely with Rickards. Because if you think about it, when you get involved in the product side, you get a whole bunch of other crap that, that isn't as just fun and isolated as the copywriting process, right? You got people complaining, you got customer service issues, maybe you ask something up with legal or something and you're getting an earful there. There's like more business type stuff outside of just writing a promo, but you have one big unfair advantage. You are the closest person to the idea machine or the approval source as you can be. So I would have exclusive access to records, which is an unfair advantage, right? Like if you, you have first access to information. So anyways, I made that jump. It was actually before, I was working more on publishing stuff before I was doing, doing copywriting, to be honest with you. So, anything else? Yes. So I'll once, get out of here. once we're set up with a publisher, yeah. are we barred from writing like a relay for another publisher? How does that ultimately work? I don't set the rules, but I'll tell you, if you were working with my group and you really, really wanted to write a relay for someone else, um, yeah, and you and I couldn't persuade you on any other idea, um, just given the friendly structure we have right now, I don't know, I'd probably say go for it, but I, I don't make the rules. I don't know. Maybe I'll handle that later. Yeah, can. Anything else? I actually have one more. Yeah. Okay. So, we were all talking, what is... Avaldo's actual situation. Is he a publisher? Who does he work for? Avaldo is this like mythical creature that just cranks <laughs> out copy all day long. <laughs> That's what it seems like. Yeah. Uh, no, Avaldo's the golden goose. He just sits in Florida and he mentors a bunch of people there and he mentors people remotely in Baltimore. Um, well, Kyle, you're in Florida, right? Um, um, but he works with certain people. He's got he's human, so he's got a bandwidth, right? I don't. He couldn't probably mentor everyone around this table at one time, right? Uh, but he's a copywriter, a copy chief in Florida. He runs that office. And uh, and then he works with select people who either want to execute on one of the ideas he has that he can't write himself, or if they come to him with an awesome idea of their own and he thinks it's awesome, you know, he's incentivized to help you guys succeed. So I'd say if you can get to him, the way to do it is have the best ideas or be very passionate about ideas that he has and can't write himself. Um, at the very least, you all should eventually get to know of Aldo. Uh, I think he's awesome. And then, uh, um, and if you can't do any of those things, you should at least go into Iris, break down the promos that Evaldo has worked on, which you can do in that system, and then read them. And that's kind of like you know, virtually learning from Evaldo. So, cool. All right, I'll get the sense. You should go. <laughs> it might be the last time you ever see Pete. <laughs> yeah, that, that actually might be true. Pete and I are doing the SEAL camp together this weekend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Pete's going with me. Yeah. So Pete, Pete and I may die. <laughs> You'll be halted by me, but that'll be the last time you see Pete. Um, before we get started, two things. One housekeeping thing, uh, and then a big present from NG to give to you guys. But first, let's get to the housekeeping thing. Um, five people, one thing you learned from the promo you read, or the promos you read since Monday. Five people, go. One, Jimmy. I learned that you can say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again if you just use a different example. Like I felt like this on Amazon's 1.1 or 1.9 trillion Bitcoin shop is just beating around the bush. And I'm like, ah, dang, you know, it's like, I get it, I get it, I get it. But if this is exciting to the reader, they want to keep reading that stuff. They want to keep getting hyped up because it's obviously working. Yep. 
Yeah. And that the proof just can't be like this is happening, it has to correlate to what you're promising and to connect. So give me an example. Um, I was reading, I don't even know where this is from, but I was reading something where, like, I say, this chart goes up. That's okay. It just, just keeps showing the chart goes up. That doesn't really tell me anything. It just shows me the chart's going up. As opposed to, like, here's the indicator that we have from our system, and here's why the chart goes up. Like, this happens, and then this happens. It's like this, and then this. Got it. Like, cause and effect through proof. Right. Yep. Right. Uh, three. Wow. Uh, just the, how important market timing is for the, uh, the IBO presentation right now. Uh, not that I'm in a position to criticize anything, but just 12.6 seconds, that little motive in the beginning, it was really confusing. And I don't know how much I liked it, but as I read a page or two, I was just like, Bitcoin's crashing, tying an IPO, ICO, huge money-making uh, scheme to the past. What the hell is an IBO? It's going to be a thousand times bigger. I wanted to know. So just the importance of timing. Cool. Four. Rob. Uh, the uh, legally required disclaimers can actually be used as like the opposite of what I don't know the word I'm trying to use. Uh, yeah. It makes it cooler yeah. actually instead of being a negative. It's like the don't tap the glass idea. Yeah. You know, you put some legal warning, don't tap the glass, sharks don't like it, and then what does everybody want to do? Right. Tap, <laughs> tap the glass. I wouldn't even thought to tap the glass. But yeah, <laughs> can, be, uh, can be used in good ways as well. They're not like you're gonna get you guys are gonna get at some point dealing with compliance and legal, you're gonna get forced into things that you may think are going to decrease response. If you get your creative hat on, figure out how to do it different ways, you can actually use them to increase response. Sometimes I've heard that technique called making your skeletons dance. Sometimes by just closing a flaw about the product, it can actually be very persuasive because you're building up trust. So if you're like, 